So welcome everyone to the virtual world of the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director, and we're delighted to welcome you to this special evening uh, in celebration of a new book uh, written by our friend Kalkalia Yang and illustrated um, by our new friend, Billy Tao, um, The Yang Warriors. Um, and we have been honored on several occasions uh, to have book events with Kalia, um, who is an East Sider. Billy is an East Sider originally. Um, it's, it's great to welcome our neighbors and our community here uh, to the East Side Freedom Library um, and to recognize how much our diverse neighbors bring uh, to our community. We've been having a great time at the East Side Freedom Library uh, with children's books. We've been doing readings every Saturday morning um, online for more than a year now uh, called Stories for Little People. Uh, we've had a variety of readers and the books have really been uh, a wonderful uh, exposure to diverse cultures and stories. And we will be soon adding the Yang Warriors uh, to that uh, roster of, of children's books. So what we're going to do tonight is um, Kalia is going to read. Um, Billy is going to uh, show slides uh, about the book in relationship to Kalia's reading. Um, then we're going to have a video about Billy's work and he'll talk a little bit too, I hope. And then we'll have some time uh, for questions and, and discussion. So it's, it's great to have you all here and I'm gonna make myself invisible and turn things over to Cal Kalia Yang. Thank you, Peter and Carla. And thank you to our friends, um, all of you for coming to tonight's launch. In a different world, we would all be gathered together in community and I think we will feel our way through what is going on in our world currently, as well as welcome this beautiful new book into the world, Yang Warriors. Came out officially on Tuesday because in this country, books come out on Tuesdays. But today, this evening is our first live community launch. I've spent all of today, yesterday, and the day before in various schools and school districts speaking about Yang Warriors and the importance of the uh, the importance of children's books, the heroes that we need to find, how they are sometimes found in our past, how sometimes they're found within us, but how almost every single day we find our heroes in each other. Mm -hmm. At no other time in American history as a child or as an adult have I looked so earnestly and desperately for the courage and the inspiration of our youngest, our children, my own and others. You know, from our environmental warriors to our social activist warriors, now is a wonderful time, I think, to find inspiration in what the young can bring and deliver. And so with that, I will start out by doing a reading of the Yang Warriors. Billy would do a screen share of the book so that as I'm reading, you'll hear the page turns, but you'll get the possible, um, the best possible visuals in this format. So Billy, if you could do the screen share. So welcome to the launch of the Yang Warriors by Kao Kalia Yang, illustrations by Billy Tao. Ban Binai Refugee Camp, 1986. Above the television set in the dark room, the legendary heroes rose, the bald monk mobilizing his energy, the honorable warrior facing his enemies the brave woman with her sword at the ready. The children sat with wide eyes and open mouths. As soon as the credits started, they raced outside to practice. In a clearing between the houses, the children bowed to their elected leader, a 10-year-old named, named May, the long word for little. Master May was tiny. Though his arms and legs were small, his belly was round and sat in his middle like a bowl. He had been chosen because of all of the cousins in the camp. He cared the most and believed the fiercest that the children were powerful warriors. 
Master May acknowledged their bows with a slow nod of his head in each direction. The children knew he would not leave any of them behind. The children saw the enemies that existed everywhere, the guards with their guns. They practiced the art of throwing rocks and thrusting sticks, the other refugee children looking for play space. They held each other by the waist and kicked the air. The lonely ghosts waiting on the other side of the fence. They ran drills, running fast in one direction and then the other, so they could confuse and outsmart. They had all heard the ghost stories. People who had died because of broken hearts or aching bellies. People who had left behind loved ones and were hungry for a return to friends and family. There were seven boys and two girls in the group. All of them were younger than Master May. Each morning at the crow of the roosters, the potbelly boy stood at the ready, lines drawn into the dirt of the camp yard. The children arrived one by one, each with a flat rock in hand. They went to their lines and balanced the stones on their heads. When their shadows disappeared beneath the noon sun, they ran to different homes for meager lunches of rice ball and dried fish. After lunch, they resumed their practice. The sticks in their hands were sacred swords. The children engaged in mental battles. Master May chose a pair of kids and the others stood in a circle around them. The chosen ones bowed. They sat cross-legged on the dirt, eyes tightly closed, backs rigid, and sent their warrior spirits into the space between them. The sun's heat traveled through their hair and clothing until sweat beaded their brows and dripped off their chins. The mental matches lasted from minutes to hours. The winner was the one whose concentration and stamina could not be shaken. Finally, Master May said, well done, disciples. One especially hot week when camp rations were thin, Master May took a seat alone in the circle of the group. He closed his eyes and meditated. After an hour, when the youngest member of the group, a five-year-old named Ong, sank on her knees from exhaustion, he opened his eyes and said, we must leave the camp to forage for greens. The younger children need it. The words were dangerous. Everyone knew the rule. No Hmong person could leave the camp without permission from the Thai guards. The children had seen men and women beaten for leaving the camp. People had disappeared after reports about their leaving had been filed. Each child drew in a breath and held it, waiting for Master May to clarify his vision, to speak of something else. But his shoulders were stiff and his eyes far off as he explained. There's a farmer with a pond full of morning glory nearby. If we're caught by the authorities or the adults, I will fulfill my destiny as your master. I will take all responsibility and bear the punishment. I was a scared child, comforted by the pillow of my mother's arms, the hold of my father's hand. I was not a member of the group. My older sister Dao was one of the two girls. She was seven years old then, a small girl with thick, messy hair, one leg shorter than the other because she had polio as baby. Her job in the group was to carry everyone's flip-flops if they were in a fight and flee situation. She was also the best at the mental battles. The night before the secret mission was hot and humid. A layer of dark clouds had gathered beneath a full moon. In our bed, Doug kicked her legs restlessly. When the songs of the crickets and the snores of our father were the only sounds in the room, Doe whispered, tomorrow might be my last day. I whispered back, why? Her voice was low and serious. Tomorrow we're going on a mission. I asked, where? We are leaving the camp to look for food. I couldn't find enough air in the room to breathe my words. You can't. Doe said, Master May believes it is the only way to save you and the younger children. You haven't had vegetables for weeks. I said, I don't even like vegetables. Besides, you'll get in trouble. The guards might kill you. 
She swallowed then said, if we don't come back tomorrow, tell mom and dad where we've gone. At first light, we set out. Long after Dove fell asleep, I could not. I listened to the sound of my scurrying, watched the light of the moon through the slits in the walls. The next morning when I woke, the bed was empty. My mother had left to tend her small garden of cilantro and green onions. My father was out carrying the day's water from the well. I looked at my sister's place beside me, and I knew she was not in the yard, standing at her line. I put my hand over my quivering belly. I watched the adults prepare lunch. My father blew into the red embers of last night's fire until a small flame danced among the burnt wood. My mother smashed chilies, green onions, cilantro, and salt in the mortar and pestle. They were thin, their faces tired. I knew they were probably hungry and scared too. Each time I closed my eyes, I saw the end of the battle scenes from the historical Chinese dramas my sister and our cousins loved. Smoke rising from the fallen houses, the bodies of the horses, men, women, and children scattered across the dirt road, bleeding and still. Fallen flags trampled into wet dirt. What if, what if my sister were killed? I was about to tell my mother about the secret mission when I saw Ong. She was wet and she carried a plastic bag of greens. She leaned it quietly by the doorway. Before anyone noticed, she left. I followed. Oh, where's Dao? Hurt. I blinked the tears away. What happened? Many were injured. The two of us ran behind the corn husk shack. My heart pounded with each step. I saw my sister lying on the dusty earth, her head on Master May's lap. There was a wound on the side of her forehead. Blood ran down her face. Another cousin was also on the ground. His foot was wrapped in an old shirt. Ong yelled, Grandma's coming. The children scrambled. By the time Grandma arrived with a switch in her hand, her head shaking left and right, the line of her mouth tight, only the fallen ones remained, with Master May now on his knees. Most of the group had been caught when they scattered. There was not much talk. No one wanted to attract the attention of the guards. Grandma's switch flew into butts, whimpers were in, and yelps were caught in throats. Master May suffered the worst of the consequences. Grandma said, you are the oldest. You could have killed them all. If the authorities find out what would happen, For lunch that day, the younger children and I ate fresh morning glory. The greens were fried with garlic oil and seasoned with fish sauce. I can still hear the crunch of the stalks and taste how the oil made the rice slippery, how the garlic made all of it slightly sweet. None of the children in the group chose to enjoy the meal with us. They watched us clear our plates. It was our first taste of freedom. Before lunch, the group had been naughty children playing a game, but after that meal, all of us saw that they were brave and powerful. I knew the adults had all survived war, but I had never imagined we children could be warriors. Long before we left Ban Minai refugee camp, the Yang warrior showed us what existed beyond the fence and gave us the courage we needed to leave. I see them now, far away from that dry, dusty, hungry place we shared beneath the burning sun, the group of warriors standing strong, Master May firm belly forward, Ong on her tiptoes trying to be older than her years, Dove chin held high, her stronger leg braced against the earth. They were my heroes, not the characters in the movies, and they're glorious in the sun of my youth. And then we have author's notes at the back. I will read my own before I introduce Billy Tao and um, we'll see if he wants to read this illustrator's note. 
Long before I knew what superheroes were, I fell in love with the gang warriors. They were my sister and my cousins, each standing in their line in the hot sun, faces trickling with sweat, eyes closed fiercely or open wide and unblinking. In Banbi Nai refugee camp, they trained for a day when their skills would save us all. Under the hot sun, they showed me that the most important work in the world is the work we give ourselves. The most important roles we'll have in life are the ones we assign ourselves. In that place where I was a child with little to do, hiding in the shade of tall trees and the safety of my mother's and my father's arms, the Yang warriors ran with purpose, fought against ideas of safety, and risked everything for something better. Now, over 30 years later, I look back to that blinding little world that was our life, above and beyond the fence, the shadows of the men and women looking out. I see the young warriors looking bravely in, looking at each other, looking for the places and the future we couldn't imagine. These warriors first taught me all the skills I would need to become a writer. Spirit, purpose, conviction, and daring. They taught me how to live without fear. Even more, they taught me how to have fun with others, how to go on adventures with those who love us, and how to salvage from our experiences, not, the only, not only the things we needed to survive, but also the hope and the beauty of sharing life's responsibilities. I hope the Yang warriors can do the same for each and every one of you. Thank you so much. At this time, I would like to invite Billy onto the screen. And Billy, you've not, you've not read the illustrator's note yet out loud. I'm wondering if you would be interested. And then, of course, introducing your, your video about the process of the Yang warriors coming together. Thank you. And I wanna say, Billy, before you begin, especially this year, you know, I'm 40 years old. I've been at this since I was 22 years old. When I first started, I wondered when the time would come for me to be open, to be in a position where I can open doors for other talent I knew existed in our community. Talent that had never gotten the opportunity to express itself across a mainstream America that needed it desperately. When I invited C Rider to do the shared room, and then you to do the Yang Warriors, I knew that I had, I come to a point I've been dreaming of for a long time. The dream never quite feels the way we imagine it when we're young, but I want you to know, Billy, that you are a part of this writer's dream coming true. I knew, and I've always known that there was somebody like you with your kind of talent in our community. And I wanna thank you for taking taking this adventure on and also for going on this journey with me in working and drawing the Yang warriors and bringing them to life. Thank you, Billy. Thank you very much, Kalia. That is very, very sweet, sweet words. And, uh, you know, being an illustrator today, a technician too. And so now with your kind words, I'm all over the place emotionally. So, but you know what, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for asking me to illustrate this beautiful, beautiful book. It is a wonderful book. And I fell in love with this story the moment I read it when uh, our editor, the University of Minnesota Press, Eric Anderson, asked me to read it. I fell in love with it because I knew that this book would mean so much uh, not just not just to me or even you or to the team, but to the Hmong children, to our readers. And so this book means so much. And so just to come back and just want to say that my name is Billy Tao. I am the illustrator of Yang Warriors. And let me tell you uh, what I just said to Kalia is true. I fell in love with this book. The first time I read this book, story again like i said it is a story where i have never even imagined to see myself in or all the Hmong children and i'm happy that this story would do such a thing and coincidentally too just with what is going on now outside it is heartbreaking um 
you can't go on social media without just seeing us just a terrible story of what is happening. And so I hope that this story will be a wonderful story for children and adults to show you that what I and Kalia try to communicate, we were trying to communicate resilience, bravery, and having hope at all times. And I do believe that as humans, we are given so many incredible traits. And some of those traits are what I just listed. And I hope we can keep going on. The illustration for this book is beyond words. And so I created a, a video, a very short video of my illustrations. And so before I switch to the video, I too would love to uh, read the illustrator's note at the back of this book to give you an idea of my goal for this book. <clears throat> Illustrator's note. I am a Hmong American who was born and raised in Minnesota. I never witnessed a horrendous war, lived in a refugee camp, or had to leave my family behind. All the stories I have heard were told by my family and survivors, and all their experiences can be traced back to the oldest art form within Hmong culture, Pandao, pronounced Pandao. Pandao is a traditional Hmong textile art that requires intensive labor of various techniques combined with embroidery to communicate stories and motifs of the Hmong experience. As an adult, looking at works of Pandao with mature eyes, I am attracted not just to its artistry, but also to the ancestors who were brave and resilient in continuing the journey of the Hmong people. Through my intensive research for these illustrations, I learned that within Hmong art and language, a puzzle of messages and truths remains that is waiting to be unfolded. To illustrate this book to the core of truth, I had to discover the hidden treasure. I studied Hmong culture and traveled back into the history of the Hmong. And I found resilience, compassion, and hope. We can agree on one thing. Life is not easy, but through a child's eye, life is fun. If children's books, including this one, have taught me anything as an illustrator, they have taught me this. To wake up early in the morning, see the orange sky hidden behind the horizon of a purple hill, and smile because life is beautiful and worth fighting for. Thank you, and we're gonna switch to the video now.
found within the Hmong culture. With the assistance from the University of Minnesota Press editor Eric Anderson, I created a storyboard and a book dummy to get a sense of the rhythm and emotion of the story. I created some watercolor concepts and I explored the interior and the exterior of the camp. I made a lot of sketches of people, animals, trees, I played with colors and I designed characters, making sure the clothes they wore and the hairstyle fits that particular period because I want to be truthful to the story. Once I felt confident and prepared, I began the illustrations. Every night I took notes and looked over my illustrations. Game warriors demonstrated many valuable traits of a warrior. They showed me heroism, bravery, sacrifice, persistence, compassion, and hope. The Ying warriors showed me that resilience is not only standing back up after you fall, but returning to the state of mindfulness. Not looking back into the past, nor forward into the future, but concentrating on what is important right in front of you. It can be anything. For me, it was you. Well, Billy, thank you. Thank you so much. Both of you. Um, you know, for some of us who might use the expression, oh, it's just a children's book. I don't think I would ever say that again um, after listening to the two of you tonight. So um, please um, enter questions in the chat or we have this mechanical form of raise your hand. Uh, and we will call on you. This is a great opportunity to interact with these two brilliant artists. Thank you so much, Peter, for having us. And thank you all of you for joining us at this time, particularly when there is so much in our world calling our attention elsewhere. And so I know it is a matter of priority that brings you here. And I wanna, I, I hope, my hope for the evening is that we can all leave a little bit more inspired mm -hmm. find within ourselves the warrior spirits that we need to stand to the test of our moment yeah. but i love east side freedom library events because in many ways they're so informal we can have honest engaged conversations without uh, mediation and so please i see the names of my students and family and friends in this in this group so if you have any questions for me or billy or peter please, please. feel free well, I'm going to start with with a question, and Kalia, you were involved in making a remarkable movie uh, called "The Place Where We Were Born," um, which also uh, is an engagement with Bon Vinay, um, and and I bet. I mean, that's got to be at least 15 years ago, maybe even more. Um, how has your thinking about Bon Vinay and its place in the development of Hmong and Hmong American culture, how has your thinking evolved about Bon Vinay? 
That is a wonderful question, Peter. For those of you who don't know, at the very beginnings of my career, I put a lyric documentary together with a good friend of mine, John O'Brien. Um, and it began because when I was studying at Columbia University to become a writer, one of my friends, a, a fellow MFA, went to the doctor and they were talking and the friend mentioned that there was a Hmong American writer in training at Columbia. This doctor could not believe it. How could there be? And she said, of course there is. Her name is, you know, Kao Kalia Yang. And the doctor said, I would love, I would love to meet her. So I met with him and it turns out that this doctor had visited Ban Binai refugee camp in 1980, December of 1980, the month, the week, the year I was born. And this doctor had taken pictures and had walked away from that camp believing that we would be very lucky if we survived at all. Mm -hmm. He hadn't seen conditions like that of Ban Binai refugee camp where there were so many poor people, so many people without education suffering from physical, but also mental health and emotional health ailments. But there I was, and there he was. And he said to me, I walked away from that camp feeling tremendous guilt. I knew about the secret war in Laos. I knew about the yellow rain that had been dispersed on the Hmong. And I knew how you were living in Ban Binai refugee camp. And I who had thought that I would live my life dedicated <clears throat> to the work of healing others. I had done nothing at each of those turns. And now here you are and you are real. And then he said, one day, I'm gonna send you all of the photos that I have, all of those newspaper clippings that I've kept because I'm an old man. I don't think I have much time to do anything with them. Will you one day do something with them? I graduated, I returned to St. Paul, Minnesota to become a writer, to finish my first book. And one hot day, there was a package in the mail for me. It was, it was kind of big and heavy. And my mom opened up this package. And the first thing that slipped out was a newspaper clipping of what appeared to me at first like a burlap sack. But my mother clutched it to her chest and she said, that's exactly what your sister looked like after the crossing. And that's when I saw that it, it was a baby in a bag of skins clinging to life. And so that very first movie, A Million Miles from the Place Where We Were Born, was my effort to revive that place. You know, when you were young, Peter, as I was leaving that camp, I believed that it would always be there. Mm. Of course, I went to Carleton College, as some of you know, and at Carleton, I had the opportunity to do a study abroad in Thailand. And in Thailand, I went searching for the place where I was born, and I found, I found where the places of my youth covered up a rubber plantation where once we had waited in the dust. And so I walked away from that place, that experience knowing that Ban Binai refugee camp would only ever be alive in the hearts and the minds of those who had been there, in the photographs and the, in, in the, um, the audio cassettes that we had recorded to each other of this place. I left that camp understanding that I, I had a role to play in remembering because the world will forget as it has proven time and again. And so I knew that I needed to remember and I knew the frailty of the human memory. And so that was for me, the act of writing and producing that their documentary. Of course, now it is some, as you say, like over a decade and some since that, since that their documentary came out. I'm now a mother, which changes everything. Because I know that one day my children, particularly because they're interracial children, will have to find within the fabric of everything I am, the pieces of who they are. We live in a world that does not try to remember Hmong, does not try to understand Hmong, does not try to memorialize what it is like to be Hmong in this world, not just in America, in Thailand, in Laos, in France, in Germany, in Canada, in French Guiana. And so now more than a responsibility, I feel it is a part of my legacy, the legacy that I've left behind. I have spent most of my life, Peter, because you've known me since the very beginning, fighting to prove that I'm a worthy enough writer, fighting to find a place in America where I might stand. At this point in my life, I understand I had been, I've been born into a great story. There is nothing to prove. There's everything to claim. The destiny that I've been, fighting for has always been mine. 
and my place of origin only speaks to my trajectory as a human being. It is not a limit, it has never been. It has always been that button for my potential, the possibilities inside of me. And so not only have my experiences of the camp changed, my experience of myself has changed since the very beginning, since I was 22 years old, when I decided that this would be my life's pursuit. I don't know if I spoke to your question, but I, I'm speaking from my heart, which is, as you know, but I always do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's see, here's a question from, from Beth Cleary. Uh, I love how the shadows of some characters are Pandal designs. Can you talk about the inspiration for this and how you chose the design? So I think this is directed primarily at Billy, please. Thank you for that question. That is a wonderful, wonderful question. So first of all, I would want to say that, again, I was born in Minnesota. I have never lived in a refugee camp. Um, one of the first struggles of researching and even trying to come up with a setting for the story um, was that I want experience. I want to know what life was like there. So I have, I've asked Kalia, like, Kalia, do you have any photos, maybe some aerial photos, anything at all? And, you know, and Kalia told me, Billy, I want you to use your imagination. And so I took that advice to heart. And what I decided to do was go back into my past. I've been a self-taught artist and illustrator for 10 years now. And, you know, through that time, I worked on so many different projects of my own. And I looked back to some of them and I started asking myself, you know what, I wanna play with shadow because I believe there is something about shadow. And I think something about shadow is psychologically important is that a shadow is our will. You know, a shadow is a part of who we are. It's our dream, our hope. Um, a shadow never leaves our side. And so I decided to use our shadows to represent our inner, our psychological, or even our spiritual being. So with that illustration of Master May and with the shadow of the heart, I wanted to exaggerate it a little bit, add a little magical realism. In the Hmong community, a leader, a leader is very, very beneficial. A leader is what leads the Hmong people. You know, even throughout the history of the Hmong, we've always prophesied that a Hmong king will come and rescue the Hmong people and lead them to a better place. You know, and today we look up to so many Hmong leaders like Senator Feng Ho or even the um, former General Bing Pao. We look up to them. And so with that illustration, what I wanted to do was show that Master Mei is a leader. He is the child the very small pot, pot belly child who's going to be leading his cousins. And with the heart, the heart is very important because it is a motif found in um, the Hmong art, the uh, bandao. And so with that in mind, what I wanted to show to the readers is that Master Mei is a leader and a very compassionate leader and he's Hmong. And so, for me, it was just playing with the inner beings, uh, just playing with what Carl Jung called the archetypes, you know, playing with the different ideas, just trying to show that these children are brave and they have a will to keep going. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. Um, there is a question about the word warrior. And uh, at least in our culture, a warrior is sort of associated with violence. And uh, the questioner asks, you know, sort of why did you choose the word warrior? Were there other warrior, other words that might communicate resilience that you considered using? So Kalia? That is a lovely question. And as a, as a wordsmith, I thought long and hard about it. Um, 
my children, my my sister and my cousins are filling off a form that they that that, that came to us in Bambi Nai refugee camp for a single bot. You could go to one of the movie houses and one of the shows that were always on with different Chinese historical Chinese dramas. And of course, they they manifested the different heroes. Um, and those heroes are often cast as warriors. But these are not your ordinary American warriors, right? These are warriors who can sit opposite each other and you send your inner being into the space between you to, to do battle. You know, they were the kind of warriors where a little girl who with one like shorter than the other could brace herself against the earth. She beat everybody every time at the, at the mental battles. And so they were not necessarily just physical. And in many ways, I wanted to do three things. I wanted to pay honor to this particular form that not just Hmong children, but most of, I think all of Asia understands very well. And it may be, begin to introduce it into the American mainstream. We know hidden dragon crouching tiger uh, as, as one of the more mainstream examples of the form. But, but it is a huge market in the world. So I wanted to tap into that beating of the word. And then I also wanted to preserve and be true to the experiences of the young warriors in my life. They saw their job, not only as, as being mental protectors, but also physical protectors of each other and us. And, and so as a writer, I wanted to write this line where I could do both. But of course, as anybody who knows me knows, um, <laughs> If, if, if the word warrior only came to what our hands and feet could do in the air, what you have here is a very tiny, tiny Hmong woman who has never capitalized on anything physical in her life, people. Um, the kind of worrying I do is the kind that brings into the world Yang warriors and all of my other work. And that also comes from this fighting heart, this maybe shamanistic heart that I've inherited from my ancestors. Thank you. Um, there's a question from another children's book author in the mix tonight, John Coy. And, and John is curious about how the two of you work together. Uh, did you or did Kalia write the text and Billy then develop the illustrations? What, what about the interaction? So I was looking for a talent in the community and because of the, the different platforms I was on social media, just looking through, that's how I discovered Billy's work actually. And so it actually was in the press. I contacted Billy first to see if there was any interest. And I knew that, he, that Billy was, would be a first time illustrator and that there would be a lot of learning to do. And so that was gonna be a growth process. A part of this experience would be exposing Billy not only to the process of creating a book, but standing on your own as an artist. You know, I was already, of course, that was three, two years ago. And so in my late thirties, and I was, I felt I could be a good example for Billy, a good mentor. Throughout the process, there were many moments that Billy reached out because Billy wanted to know where I thought he might go or what I thought might be useful. And every time I said, trust yourself, Billy, I'm coming to you because there are things that you are doing that are working so well on the page. Part of this is to discover not only your abilities as an artist, but your metal as a human being. To survive as an artist, you have to be strong in many different ways. And so we had meetings throughout the process. And each time I met Billy, the thing that impresses me about Billy's work, and I think you all can see in, in the final product, Billy is a good student. Billy wants to learn and Billy will learn from, he will learn from me, he will learn from every source that he can get his hands on. You know, and so I knew that it was going to be that kind of collaboration. And thankfully, um, John, I saw was your question. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, Eric Anderson was also up for the job. The beauty about coming from many different presses and with many different editorial teams is that they allow me to showcase certain parts of myself. In the end, I'm a whole artist, but certain presses will allow me to take certain kinds of risks. And with Eric, he understood from the very beginnings that it was very important for me at this point in my career to be opening pathways into the arts for members of the Hmong community and other refugee and often marginalized communities. And so Eric was up for the task. And, and from my end, that was it. Billy, what do you have to add? Sure. Um, you know, at first I was hesitant. Again, I was a, a, a first 
a self-taught artist too. And being asked to illustrate this book, there was hesitation. Um, my only my only hesitation was, am I going to am I going to be successful? Am I going to make it? You know, I I don't know if I'm going to make it. But with research and just talking to Kalia and our editor Eric, I began to feel very confident um, because. Again, through, in the past, in the experience of my art, I started to find myself. I realized, oh, I think I should do that, or I'm gonna do this. And so through this process, what I really learned was I have to accept that it is the art that is, that is leading me now. I shouldn't be leading the art. It is the art. It is the story. The story is what's leading me in. My only job was to find was to find inspirations. You know, I when I was illustrating the story, something I was always telling myself is that illustrating a children's book is like making a movie. Only difference is that I play the director, the art director, the, the composer, I, I add everything in there. And I discovered that that is just one of the greatest joy. And it, it's a feel good feeling. And I loved every every minute of it. And the times I go to Kalia is because I also want to be truthful to the story. You know, I really want to be truthful to the story. I want to add some references of her into the story. So, for example, if you look at the illustrations of the children in a circle and the three clouds of the children, because in her book, The Late Homecomer, she talks about the children coming from the clouds. And so I decided, you know, I want to add some reference of who she is in there. You know, I want to play with the shadows, you know, the ghosts, the ghosts of her past, and they're coming back. But with her life, what I want to show that too, within her life, and even who she is, is that even her, she is very brave. She is very well. She wouldn't got here, you know, without that strong will of hers. And so, although I did not get the chance to work closely with her, I got to know her just through that story and through the illustrations. Thank you. Um, are there other questions coming into the chat? No. So um, let me ask, what's next for both of you? What's your, are you in a project already? And what, what would you share with us what that project is, Kalia? I would be delighted to. So on October 5th, I have another children's book coming out from Learner Books. It is called From the Tops of the Trees, and it commemorates one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. You know, when in Banminai Refugee Camp, this place that has birthed so many stories inside of me, as well as the body that is me. Um, my dad used to take me to the tops of the trees to take photos. When I mentioned this in The Late Homecomer, it was the one part of my book where my workshop mates were like, no father does that. What kind of father takes their child up to the refugee, you know, to the tops of the trees to get a photo? And I'm like, the kind of father that my father is. And I had to prove it in the book with a photo. So in The Late Homecomer, there's a photo of my father carrying me to the very tops of the trees where I'm looking pretty shaken and mortified but he's forcing me to look beyond the fence. Mm -hmm. Always, always, he says on the horizons that one day his daughter might walk. Maybe he'll never get to, but his daughter might one day walk. And so this is the story of that picture come to life. And I think it's particularly necessary because of the stereotypes that govern men of color, fathers of color, Hmong fathers in particular and their relationships to their daughter. I have, I've had the honor of being the daughter of a wonderful man who's never seen in me the limitations of my size or my gender or my heart. And so it is, I think it is one of the important stories of my life realized with the incredible artwork of, of Canadian illustrator, Rachel Wara. So that's coming on October 5th. But what I will spend my summer working on is a book that I promised Andrew Carr, one of the most exciting editors for um, middle grade and young adult right now in the country. A book about a young Hmong boy who is destined to become a great shaman, but all the great shamans are dead. So how? Um, it's titled The Diamond Explorer after in honor of my little brother Maxwell. 
and his fifth summer of life where he spent the whole summer on, on, on our driveway sifting through the dirt and we didn't know why but near the end of the summer he he found this tiny little red thing and he came running into the house and he said i've been looking for diamonds all summer so that i might be able to help my one of my younger sisters go to college but i i couldn't find a diamond what i have found though is a ruby a ruby that he ended up putting in a bottle of water that our father ended up drinking so so the diamond explorer then becomes this um this model for me to explore what it is like to be a young boy who speaks with a thick accent, but belongs to older Hmong parents who must somehow find his way from the Minnesota prairie to the land of his ancestors to garner the riches of his identity and give that to everyone. He is the diamond that he spent his whole summer looking for. So that, those are just two of the things I'm working on. In addition to a book for adults coming from Atria Books titled Return of the Refugees, a long awaited memoir for me about my mother's life. Wow. wow. Well, I look forward to your sharing all of them with us in, in due time. Thank you. And Billy, what are you up to? So for me, so I have not, I haven't told, a lot of people this, but I suppose tonight will be the night. Uh, but I have uh, talked to Kalia and asked her too. But um, I asked her to be my mentor. I like, Kalia, you've inspired me to fall in love with children's book again. And so I want to try children's book. And luckily enough, um, back in November, an editor, her name is Naomi from Beaming Books. She reached out to me and asked me, Billy, you're your art are beautiful. Are you working on something? Email me. And so with that in mind, I've been very uh, ambitious. So right now I'm just formulating ideas of hmm, what do I want to write about and even possibly just illustrate. So right now I'm in that phase of just formulating ideas. And one of the ideas I have is of, um, of my brother Raymond. I, I started as a personal care assistant back in 2006. And I've worked with my brother Raymond uh, for such a long time now, such a long time. And in our Hmong community, um, I don't, to me, I never knew that there was a, a community for disability, especially for Hmong individuals. And so having that in mind, I want to tackle that topic of what it's like to have uh, a Hmong sibling who is struggling with disability. And so I can't go too far because I, have, I haven't gone that far yet um, with how I want to um, develop it. And then a second too is that um, another editor from, from Lee and Lowe has also reached out to me and same thing asked me, email me if you have a project. So even with that too, I'm still thinking. And so, and so it's giving me a lot of uh, positivity. It's giving me optimism to formulate ideas, to come up with things, stories, and just submit it. And so I'm just working on that. And um, I was commissioned to, I believe, by the uh, Society of Children's Book Writer and, Writers and Illustrator to create a uh, nonfiction conference illustration. And so I'll be working on that. But most importantly, um, as, as artists, we go back and we hone our craft. We go back and we sketch, we work find inspiration and we just keep honing it because um, I'm starting to notice too now that after finishing the book, I'm getting rusty. Even my my illustration, my drawing is getting rusty. And so now it's time to come back to exercising it. And so that will be the plan for this year. That's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, so um, I know that Kalia has another engagement tonight. Um, and uh, promised we would wrap up by eight. I want to encourage everyone uh, to come visit us at the Eastside Freedom Library um, where the Hmong archives are also located. And even in this period of the pandemic, it is possible make an appointment, wear a mask. Uh, we will find a time to, to get you in. Well, the Hmong Archive has more than 2,000 Pandao. Um, come and get inspired. 
uh, look for those ghosts that that Billy's been talking about. Thank thank you both so much for sharing this with us. Carla, are you able to show the slide to help people learn how they can buy this book? I just also want to say to those of you who know a map into the world, the East Side Freedom Library is also the home to Bob's special bench now. After <laughs> Bob passed away, his children offered it to me, but it, it wouldn't be right for me to keep it um, for, for myself. And so I con connected Peter with a family, and now the East Side Freedom Library is home to Bob's special bench. So if you want to see a piece of a map into the world come to life, um, please visit the Eastside Freedom Library. That is only one of the beautiful treasures that they have there. Thank you. Thank you, Kalia. And of course, a copy of A Map into the World sits on Bob's bench um, for people to look at while they sit in it. And we want to inspire the imaginations in all kinds of ways. And looking at Pandau, sitting on Bob's bench, listening to Kalia read, so many ways to inspire um, the imaginations. Thank you, and we, and we do wanna thank our friends at the University of Minnesota Press um, for also supporting this event tonight and encouraging us to do it. So um, Kalia and Billy, you've given us resilience and hope to take with us out into this difficult world that we're living in and to all of us to try to make it better. Th thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, and we hope to see you again.